the small town of Webster, Pennsylvania, seemed to sit in a continual haze across the Monongahela River from the north. A rapidly industrializing town of 13,000 residents, many of whom were employed at the zinc works. Smoky skies in the Mon Valley were often looked at as a sign of success and prosperity. Norma Todd, a longtime resident, stated, People used to say, it's smoky and all that, but it puts bread on the table. The zinc mill in Denora was one of the big employers. A great number of people who worked there were of Spanish descent. They had come from Spain to Cherryville, Kansas, where there was a zinc mill. And then when the zinc mill was built in Denora in 1915, it was the largest in the world and most modern, so they came here. The smoke took its toll on the valley, however, and some residents of Webster had enough, prosperity or not. Erosion had stripped hillsides of vegetation. Homes took on a dull grayish hue in appearance, and a heavy broom seemed to envelop the town. Frustrated Webster residents, led by Abe Salapino, formed the Society for Better Living, which promoted fresh air and green grass, two things to which Webster, Pennsylvania, had only fleeting memories. Here, Brian Charlton, director of the Denora Smog Museum, explains. The people of Webster have gotten tired of actually just uh, taking what the Zinc Works was dishing out year after year. So they decided to get a group together, raise some money, take American Steel and Wire to court. Sometimes they were successful, most times they were not. A lot of times they ran out of money, and whenever American Steel and Wire would appeal a decision, and it was just kind of lost. So this is a group uh, we have, in the past, we have groups like uh, John Muir and the Sierra Club. We have Gifford Pinchot, we have Theodore Roosevelt, and they're more environmentalists. They're looking to preserve uh, nature. Uh, this is the first group in America that I've come across that's actually taken a major industrial player like American Steel and Wire uh, to court. And so this is the first time that this happens in 1936. Thus began the philosophical battle between industry, prosperity, and employment, and the need to protect the environment. This battle would reach its crescendo in 1948, when at least 20 residents of the Mon Valley perished and thousands became ill, resulting from a combination of fumes produced by the zinc plant and a strange weather occurrence known as inversion. It would result in a critical turning point for the town of Denora, the burgeoning environmental movement that had its roots across the river in Webster and the role of legislators on how to deal with a long ignored but now urgent issue. The event was the Denora Smog. The town of Denora depended on the zinc works. It was the largest employer in the town and almost every family was connected to the operation in one form or another. The pollution from the zinc works was simply something the residents of Denora were accustomed. The white smoke that emanated from the smokestacks, however, was taking its toll. The prevailing winds lifted the haze across the river and killed vegetation in Webster. However, in late October of 1948, the white smoke was stagnant. In a strange weather occurrence known as inversion, the town's source of prosperity would now spell its demise. During an inversion, there is a deviation in atmospheric pressure, which causes pollution to be trapped close to the ground. Without an air current to disperse the effluent from the mill, the thick, polluted air descended into the Monongahela Valley and would wreak havoc. It was an inversion set up where the air would not move and the fog just settled in and that was it. It was like a blanket and there wasn't a thing anyone could do about it and it was strong and powerful. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. There was no sound, there was nothing, there was no one out. At first, there was no state of panic in the town, but pharmacist Rosemary Imes did notice a significant spike in business, especially among those in most dire need of help. It was almost all respiratory and pulmonary. But now a lot of these people, as I said before, had pre-existing conditions and uh, so some of them had prescriptions for it, most of them didn't, and uh, so, but it, it was all respiratory. And maybe their eyes would burn, but they weren't considered a, 
concerned about that. They just wanted something to help them bring up phlegm and that type of thing. While most of our residents were used to the smoke, it was never in a stagnated state the way it was in late October of 1948. The elderly and those with pre-existing conditions were now in grave danger. As the smog and smoke thickened, hundreds were now falling seriously ill and some were now on the verge of death. The switchboard in town lit up. Alice Uranak was heading to work the morning the smog was taking its deadly toll on the town. I mostly remember uh, it was walking to work in the morning. Uh, I started at 7 o'clock and uh, it was dark and, and smoky, but it was always like that in Denora because we had the mills, so I didn't, I didn't realize that anything was wrong until I got uh, to the office and I rang the bell to get in, the door, the thing. And the girl that let me in came to the top of the steps and she said, hurry up, get up here and get your set on. She says, people are dying. So then, uh, that, you know, that was, what, that, that was the beginning of it. As the conditions worsened, hospitals were overrun with patients. Local firefighters and first responders set into action to assist. Sadly, the incident would turn deadly. Officially, the death toll was listed at 20, but many feel that number was grossly underestimated. Longtime Nora resident and historian Dr. Charles Stacy provides more detail. 28 people were killed that week, and it's believed that 50 others died in the month following the smog, 50 more than normally would have died in Denora at that time, so the actuary said. It did not take long to realize that this was becoming a serious situation, and almost all knew that the zinc works owned and operated by U.S. Steel was the cause. The town was in a quandary. Something needed to be done to deal with this environmental disaster, but at the same time the town's residents were fearful of what may happen to their jobs. After numerous investigations, U.S. Steel continued to insist that the smog disaster was simply an act of God. But as more and more reports fleshed out the details of why so many people became ill and died as a result of the pollution, change was inevitable. Gradually, the zinc works was phased out of operation, and while the economy in Denora was seriously affected, a greater good did emerge. As environmental awareness came to the forefront, many looked to Denora as the impetus for change. When the time comes that you can't get your breath, you're in real trouble. They just couldn't go through it any longer or put up with it. They couldn't survive. So uh, we helped those we were able to help as much as we could. And uh, the rest, why, uh, I guess they were the ones to be given credit for bringing something to life here that uh, we never realized was in existence. The first Clean Air Act was passed in 1955, but 15 years later, under the guidance of President Richard Nixon, Congress passed an amended Clean Air Act in 1970 that placed very strict regulations on factories and mills and helped bring about dramatic improvement in air quality in the United States. In the long run, there were two great impacts. Number one, I believe it led to the closing of the zinc works in Denora, which meant unemployment for a great number of people. But maybe more importantly, in the long run, it led to the uh, environmental age in this country, the passage of the Clean Air Act in 1970, and more emphasis upon environmental matters throughout the United States. I think it's a pivotal event in the evolution of environmentalism in the United States. Today, some residents of Webster and Denora, Pennsylvania, may take for granted the clean air they breathe, but the price of that clean air was steep. The town of Denora, although a shell of its former glory days when the zinc works was in full operation, is making every effort possible to make people aware of the role their town played in being the impetus for change. The Denora Smog Museum and commemorative memorials in the town stand as reminders of the toll that was taken. Across the Monongahela River in Webster, clean air is the one true legacy that remains for Abe Celepino and the often ignored efforts of the Society for Better Living that first promoted fresh air and green grass. 
It is indeed a living legacy we can be thankful for.